When somebody says a franchise has been with me all my life, it's usually a mark of great respect and loyalty for that series. When somebody says they grew up with Pokemon, for example, from what I can tell, they probably feel indebted to the series and all the formative memories they had of growing up with it. But what happens when you look at the modern state or even the future of a franchise that's been with you all your life and just feel a subtle yet growing sense of apathy? My life without the Super Smash Bros. series would not only be drastically different, but I think drastically worse as well. That's not even an exaggeration at all. This silly Nintendo crossover fighting game shaped who I am today, and the memories of the games are linked to some of my most formative moments. So, in this video, I'd like to go over my history with Super Smash Bros, and sort of review each game as I go along. Super Smash Bros shaped what I like, what I don't like, introduced me to so many game franchises, so many friends, and changed my life in a lot of different ways. This Super Smash Bros franchise was always there for me. But this video won't take the same tone as my previous My Journey with videos, the ones I made on Metal Gear, Street Fighter, and Mario. Cause sure, I feel frustrated with the modern states of a couple of those franchises, but something feels different about Smash. Maybe it's burnout from years of thinking about it, or maybe it's just that I don't think it will live up to expectations. But the successor to the Nintendo Switch is coming soon, and I low-key dread the possibility of another Smash Bros game on there. I love this series, I really do, but sometimes Smash feels like the monolith from 2001 A Space Odyssey to me. It's given me so much, and I feel like I should be grateful to it, but when I look at it, all I see is an ominous entity that stares down at me. After being a part of discourse on the series for years, Smash almost feels alien. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how I got into the series with Super Smash Bros. Brawl. And before we do, I would appreciate it if you subscribed and maybe watched another video here. Thanks. My journey starts when my parents got me a Wii. I was literally in kindergarten, so this would have been 2010. I'm sure that just made some people watching feel really old, but young people make YouTube videos too, okay? I got a few games for it, including Super Mario Galaxy, Lego Star Wars, and Mario Kart Wii. This is where I first started playing and learning about the Mario series. Also among the lineup was Super Smash Bros. Brawl. But you know, I was a 5 year old, and that's rated T, so it went on the shelf for at least a few years, till I was truly ready. I would have been in 2nd grade when I first actually played it, and oh my god did it blow me away. I played as Bowser of course, cause Mario was the only series I knew about in this game, I didn't even know about Pokemon yet, and playing as the bad guy was cool. I still vividly remember my first match, me versus King DDD on Isle Delfino. I picked that location cause I had played Super Mario Sunshine already, and the match was 20 minutes long for some reason. I got my ass kicked, but it didn't matter because it was still a lot of fun. Brawl's combat still holds up in my opinion. It's very chaotic and might be a pretty damn janky, but it feels like a Mario Kart Wii level of chaos, so very fun. And if you're alright with the chaos, I will stand by the fact that playing with a Wii remote on its side, not that bad. I honestly like that this game is made for fun primarily. That said, there's some poor balance and an almost abandonment of the competitive scene which Melee had, and that's lame, but a topic for another day. Cause to a kid back then, it doesn't matter that Meta Knight is broken. What really makes Smash Bros great in my opinion though is the original modes, and shortly after playing it, I dug through all of the game. I played classic mode with every single character. The challenges and the challenge mode were so much fun, as was looking through all the trophies. It was genuinely interesting to play some older games through Masterpieces mode, and read about them in Chronicle. There was a goddamn stage builder, some characters to unlock, and of course, the crown jewel of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, at least back in the day, the subspace emissary mode. Super Smash Bros. Brawl's story mode. Today when I look back on the subspace emissary mode, I think it's kinda silly. The cutscenes have a weird tone, and there's some frankly bizarre characterizations like Wario's entire portrayal, but I do have a soft spot for it. It bridges characters' universes together in some surprisingly clever ways, and I like the way cutscenes tell their story without dialogue, while still being cinematic and epic. 
the beat em up slash platformer gameplay is a great system for this type of thing too. I loved this as a kid, cause it's so epic and cool and memorable, but there's lots of parts in the story mode that feel a little juvenile. I'm overall glad it exists though, and it's better than a more safe option for a story mode. In digging through the pile that is this game, I definitely learned a lot about each series in Smash, and they all began to feel like a vital part about how I thought about video games. As I grew up, I watched YouTube and online content, and this is where I discovered series like Kirby, half my username, or Pokemon, and it's where I learned about almost every single series in the game. Today I've played at least one game from every single series in Smash, besides Splatoon, Bayonetta, and whatever you call the Rob series. And that all had to start somewhere. I'm talking about fighters here. I have not actually played Sute Haku. Brawl was like a gateway to all this, and I think I genuinely gained a lot of knowledge from it. I mean, I even watched channels like The Game Theorists or Did You Know Gaming at the time. Smash made me love video games. I have really fond memories of playing Super Smash Bros. Brawl with friends too, and this was a foundational memory for me. Brawl was a comfort game for me, and thinking about it now brings me back to those simpler times. I would mostly play with my sister, but as a kid I would always go to a daycare for about an hour after school, and playing Brawl was always a common pastime that helped us connect to each other there. I remember playing Snake a lot, because I found the tonal difference really funny, but later I ended up playing as DDD a lot because I realized he's even funnier than that. I was also the kid who always won. My friends got better now, so I'm no longer that person. I have been humbled, or have also been humbled by all your comments telling me how I lost to CPUs. Thank you. Eventually, of course, when I was about grade 3 or 4, a little follow-up to Super Smash Bros. Brawl was unveiled. Super Smash Bros. for 3DS and Wii U. I had a Wii U at this point, and I actually played some classic Nintendo games like Earthbound or Kirby Superstar on Virtual Console, so I was getting more into Nintendo and video games. I was very excited for the game. I watched lots of videos and news about it, but it wasn't really at the point where I got too hyped for new characters and stuff. I was more excited for the presence of new fighters rather than the fighters themselves. I was only in 4th grade after all. I do remember when the Great Cave offensive stage leaked though, since I was familiar with that from Kirby Superstar, that was a good moment. My biggest hot take is that I still like that stage. This game looks so cool and advanced and like an evolution of everything in Brawl, so I eagerly anticipated it. And this was the Wii U version by the way, I didn't have a 3DS quite yet, strictly talking Wii U here. It was a dark and snowy early November night when me and my mom walked into a game store and my mom encouraged me to walk up to the counter and to ask if they had Super Smash Bros for Wii U. He said they had the 3DS version but not the Wii U version. It didn't release until later on in the month. I got the date mixed up, comes out on the 21st not the 12th. Oh well, just gotta wait a bit longer. It was a snowy, late November day when me and my family were getting family photos done. This was the day Super Smash Bros. for Wii U released, and buying it was a thought in the back of my mind, but I didn't really think I would get it today. My parents made me do chores to save up allowance for the Wii U when that came out, and I assumed this would be the same for this game. We took the pictures and had fun. The experience every kid dreads of standing for pictures was soothed somewhat by the photographer being nice, but then my mom started to feel a sharp pain. Eventually, she went to the hospital, and my dad took us to the mall as she went. I went to the GameStop, then known as EB Games, and asked my dad about the game, so he bought it without much trouble. That was surprising to me, because my parents were both somewhat hesitant to buy me most new games I asked for, especially so close to Christmas. They're great people, of course, great parents. I'm not complaining about them for not getting a bunch of random material things, to be clear. In hindsight, though... It was obvious why my dad got it for me so quickly this time. My mom turned out to have gallbladder stones, and she eventually required hip surgery, which was a years-long process. That was just the beginning of my family's issues, as the time away from work caused her to lose her job, so she sued her employer and eventually settled out of court, but that's a story for... probably never, because strangers on the internet don't need to know every detail about our lives. 
Thanks for watching though. It didn't matter now, of course, because I had Super Smash Bros. for Ryu. This gave gave me comfort, and even though I had a pretty bad year at school where I was separated from my best friend, this was a game I could fall back on. I don't have too many memories of my first moments playing Smash for Wii U, but I do know that it was a lot of fun gameplay-wise. It almost takes a more precise approach to gameplay than Brawl did, with a bit less chaos. The focused approach is welcome, and there's a lot more polish and display in the movement and the moves themselves as well. There's a bit less weird characterizations like whatever was going on with Luigi and Brawl as well. I quickly unlocked all the characters and dug through all the extra content and stuff here too. There's not as many modes to play as Brawl, but there's still some fun content to go through, and once again, I got nearly every trophy in the game. It's a game you can just spend hours grinding and not really get sick of. I also really like the newcomers in the game a lot. Duck Hunt and Little Mac, for example, are characters that I think should have been in the series way sooner. And while most people don't really regard Smash Force newcomers as hype, they still feel really cool to me. A lot of stages like Skyloft or Mario Kart were absolutely epic as well. Smash 4 added a lot to the series, even if I wish it was just a bit as replayable as Brawl was. Of course, Smash 4 basically became the number one game I'd play with friends over too. This game continued to be one of my favorites of all time, and I still have a lot of fond memories with it. I also felt like I had learned a lot about video games in general at this point too, even if Smash Ultimate later on would have much more of an effect on me in that regard. Speaking of which, I will stand by the fact that Smash for Wii U is still worth playing, even after Ultimate is here, at least playing casually. The gameplay feels different and the classic mode and other modes are interesting enough to give it a shot. It's not outdated, okay? But that said, Smash Ultimate is where the series truly consumed me. It was where I truly was caught in the hype cycle, and that's the entry that truly changed my life at the most pivotal moment. It was the moment Super Smash Bros. became inescapable. I mean, Smash 4 had some DLC though, that was cool, even if by now, my consistent excitement for the series had faded away. I was in about the 5th grade and only had Nintendo consoles, so I didn't really have a good picture as to what video game history was like beyond a surface level. I didn't know who Cloud or Ryu was, and I didn't play Smash 4 as consistently. I would occasionally pick it up, but never for more than a week. The moment I'd say I truly learned about video game history and where it became more of a priority for me was in 8th grade. Of course, that was when Super Smash Bros. Ultimate came out. Uh, there were some other Smash games though, believe it or not, which I want to talk about here. Believe me, I'd talk about Ultimate Plenty later on in this video. Patience, young ones. There were always various different places like conventions or gaming bars I went to that had Smash 64 and Melee, and I played them a lot that way. Smash 64 is very simple and hard to get into if you're used to other games, but I'd say this is the most consistent Smash game. The menus look the best, and stages have a dreamlike quality you don't really get in later entries. Melee has a cool Y2K aesthetic, and while I haven't played some of its single player modes, I respect the slippery, almost free flowing gameplay a lot, and it's one of the most distinct Smash games gameplay wise. I also hella respect it introducing trophies, and lots of other parts in the series I love. I love you, Sandbag. Then there's Smash for 3DS, which is the entry I have the least amount of experience with. I bought it not too long ago now, and just kinda dicked around with Smash Run, although I had played the game before at a friend's house. It certainly is Smash for Wii U on the 3DS screen, that's for sure, except for when it isn't. This game, it has original content. I'd have to play a bit more to convey my thoughts on it, uh, but it is a solid title. Anyways, so Nintendo does this thing where they announce all their new titles and games in one presentation called the Nintendo Direct. Those directs would go on to be very tied to Smash, cause it's how their fighters were primarily announced. I didn't really watch Nintendo Directs live at this point, but I did pay attention to some stuff in them. In one year, a little Splatoon thing transitioned into a massive, fiery Smash Ball and a new Super Smash Bros. was unveiled for Nintendo Switch. Hey look, 
Link looks like how he does in Breath of the Wild. That's cool. I mostly just said neat and talked about it with my friends on the playground and all that, but I was genuinely excited over it, and I was starting to lurk in some online spaces discussing Smash as well. Smash, as an entity, was growing in my brain. I remember there being a lot of discussion on if this would be a port or a new title, which I think was mostly spurred on by fake leaks that said Smash 4 would be on Switch, which didn't actually happen. There was some stupid discourse about if Smash Ultimate counts as a port though, which is silly and not really relevant to our discussion. The ball of my hype didn't truly get rolling until much later on when the title was properly unveiled. I frequented IGN at this point, which is cringe, I know, but believe me, I've been on worse sites. And one day I went on there just to see an article about an announcement Nintendo just made. I saw the title Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, so cool, and a picture of the two most highly requested newcomers for the game at the time, Daisy from Mario and Ridley from Metroid. It was surreal, especially once I clicked on the article and found that every single Super Smash Bros. character would be returning as a playable character. Rather than a massive wave of hype hitting me at once, it felt like a switch was flipped. And now, I was in a bizarre world where something like this could happen. Not only did those new characters look cool, there were plenty of stages that were exclusive to the 3DS which are now being brought to Switch. And I never even got to try the DLC characters of Smash 4, so it was like tens of newcomers were being announced with the games unveiling to me. Plus it had been a long time since I touched Brawl, which made this like a nostalgic thing for me too. I genuinely could not believe this was happening. It made me want to see more. And so begins the period of my life where I was engrossed in ultimate hype culture, and I became much more than just an observer. I learned as much as I could about each series and played more different types of games than I did before, even games that weren't in Smash. I remember playing quizzes on a website called Sporkle about Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, and I do stuff like name every character, trivia about the character, or even all the games that the characters debuted in. I'd even make some quizzes of my own there, and I used the site for years. I'd tell people that Radmobile and not Sonic the Hedgehog was Sonic's debut game. All kinds of autistic stuff like that. I could name the year Donkey Kong came out. God, I felt so powerful. Really, I engage in a lot of fandoms online, not simply exclusive to Smash, and it was so much fun. But there's one site I joined in particular that would affect me in a more profound way, and that is a website called Smashboards.com. I specifically joined on September 15th, 2018, so a little over five years now, and shortly after I entered the 8th grade. Smashboards is a site dedicated to talking about Super Smash Bros, which had existed since the 2000s, but by now had mostly shifted from talking about the competitive side of Smash to newcomer speculation, and the series itself. People would make support threads for whichever characters they wanted the most, and discuss their chances. To be honest, I was never that invested in one particular newcomer. I never really had a favorite character idea that stuck for very long, but I lent support to a lot of different ideas from Bandana D to Waluigi. The Waluigi support was semi-ironically, by the way. I would say this is where I really joined the Smash community, because it's the first place I regularly talked about Smash with other people, and I saw what the series meant to others. A lot of people tied newcomers to their identities, and there's so many ups and downs in a community that stakes so much of their enjoyment of this series on the characters. When I joined the fandom, Smash as a concept began to dwarf what I thought it already was. It became even more massive than Super Smash Bros. Ultimate already looked like it was going to be. I talked a bit on the various threads of the message board site, made some dumb jokes I thought were funny, then mostly stayed off the site or lurked. For now. The 8th grade was a really important time for me. Basically, I had moved schools, but I knew a couple of people at the place I went to, and the whole experience felt freeing to me. It wasn't perfect, but this is where I began to form an image of who I am to this day, and a lot of my favorite pieces of media I discovered in the 8th grade. This is where I watched JoJo, the other half of my username. 
It was at this point in my life I was on the Smash hype train. So really, it was there at the most foundational moment in my life, and it helped me discover myself. I gained more confidence talking to people, and every day I thought about how good Ultimate was going to be. Even my school's janitor was excited for the game. Love that guy. Eventually, of course, I ended up using Smash boards more and more, mostly just popping in there whenever a new Direct happened. So I decided to watch Nintendo Directs live now, which definitely heightened my community solidarity. The first Direct gave us Simon and Richter Belmont from Castlevania, which was a franchise I knew about and I had seen Simon request enough for Smash that he was definitely on my radar. I didn't know who Richter was, but I will stand by the fact it was weird that so many Smash fans didn't know who Richter was. I also want to point out how cool these CGI trailers were to be at the time. Sure, they probably took up way too much of Smash's budget, but it was cool to see these cute little trailers that tried to plant clues about what the character could be early on, and ramp up to an exciting character reveal. I remember seeing mummies in the dark scary area and assumed they were the ones from Zelda, and that it would be a reveal for Impa. God, I was stupid. There's also a particularly memorable moment in the trailer where Luigi gets his literal soul reaped by the Grim Reaper, and uh, I want to talk about memes. That was a huge meme at the time, and man, I thought it was just the dankest meme lord, and memes were a lot about how I engage with Smash. I, it almost felt carefree looking back at the days where I would laugh at a picture of Piranha Plant chuckling at Waluigi or something. It was all so fun. I remember in particular a channel called Jaden Wilson, which uploaded weekly Nintendo meme compilations, which I watched all the time with my friend over and over again. I also remember in particular how Masahiro Sakurai, the director of the game and face of those directs, had so many memes of him, and many times he often served as the face of many epic dank memes as well. This was peak Reddit era, okay? I watched plenty of YTPs because that was my humor style, and I even discovered Shaferless Productions, a channel I still like today through memes, and I will admit I did in fact watch my fair share of SMG4 as well at the time. This was right when that channel started having the weird dramatic storylines where the characters would, like, die and shit. It was weird, but great for a 14 year old. Oh, and King K. Rool. K. Rool was another newcomer announced in that direct alongside the Castlevania characters, and it was my lesson to not click off the direct before Sakura says, oh, and one more thing. I thought it was a decent surprise, but once I saw some memes about it and everybody raving on it, I quickly shifted to, oh my god, King K. rules in Smash, that's so amazing, I want him for years actually, I've I known about him ever since I was a fetus. Isabelle's edition certainly added a lot of memes too, and some Echo Fighters like Krom or Dark Samus were added not too far off from her. And then the last two characters, Incineroar and Ken were not so alongside the surprise final one, Piranha Plant. I initially thought Piranha Plant was going to be an exclusive character for if you bought the Fighters Pass, so I was skeptical, but once I realized that wasn't true, I just continued as is. Oh god, the plant memes. Haha, <laughs> it certainly is funny how Waluigi was in before Waluigi. I mean, yeah, fuck, I'm keeping it like this. Oh god, the plant memes. Haha, ha, it certainly is funny how Wa Piranha Plant is in, but Waluigi isn't. Piranha Plant in Smash before GTA 6. Okay, look, I was just happy to be on this ride, really. I felt like I was part of something bigger than myself. There is a weird quirk about the website Smashboards. The site has a functionality where you can make profile posts on your account, but those posts show up on the front page. I would read through all the new profile posts as people make them, and would make my own, responding to others as I saw statements that interested me. Whenever something interesting happened or I had a thought I wanted to share, I'd just post it there. I'd use it the same way someone would use Twitter, really, and I'd communicate with others who regularly used it too. To this day, Smashboards is my primary social media. The ones who did this with me became known as the Profile Post Gang, and they were my main group of online friends. We talk in Discord every single day to this day, and it got me through a lot of tough times, especially during the pandemic where I didn't really have many friends to talk to. All of this was given to me by Super Smash Bros. 
it's almost intimidating just how much time this game's hype cycle took up for me. In times of uncertainty, this one game kept me afloat. I wanted to thank it, but one plastic box with the cartridge inside is impossible to speak to. Another activity I like to do was make hypothetical moveset for Super Smash Bros. characters. I watched a dude named Brawlfan1, and making movesets was a way to express love and hype for this series. I stayed away from playing Smash for Wii U up to the lead up to Ultimate, by the way. I know some people would have played it in anticipation, but I had a Switch, my Wii U was not getting plugged back in, and the act of not playing Smash for a while just made me anticipate Ultimate more. Anyways, I made movesets that deliberately tried to replicate elements from a character's original source a lot, very inspired by Brawl Fan 1, and eventually my sweaty 8th grade self made some movesets for anime characters as well, mostly Dragon Ball characters. I doubt there were any good though. Eventually, I had an idea for an anime themed platform fighter that uses these movesets, and I mean, I had Dragon Ball and Naruto, so obviously I had to watch some One Piece and Bleach to know how to make movesets for them. Bleach I don't remember much about, but One Piece won Nintendo games at the time too, with Breath of the Wild being my favorite. Super Smash Bros is basically the reason for this. I mean look at other videos I made about some of my favorite game series. My journey with Metal Gear and my journey with Street Fighter. I got into both because of Smash. At this point, it's easier to list out my current hyperfixations that weren't linked to Smash than those that were. Eventually, Super Smash Bros. Ultimate released. Okay, admittedly some of those things came after, but whatever. In terms of the gameplay, Smash Ultimate was everything I could have asked for. There's value in previous game styles, of course, but Ultimate is so polished and refined, while keeping a lot of intricacies in gameplay, like air dashes, or even wave dashes from Melee that it feels more respectful to the past than Brawl was. For the most part, everyone looks and plays great, and you better believe this was the number one game of choice for me and my friends for a long time. I mean there's literally like 70 characters, this entire game is one massive party, and I don't think I could begin to explain how fun the late hours spent playing Smash Ultimate were. It's still one of my go-to games when I have friends over. There's absolutely a lot of single player content in the game too. The big new adventure mode on display is World of Light, where you progress through battles based on characters from each franchise, on maps based on those franchises too. It was really cool to see different series get referenced so deeply. There's all kinds of subworlds from each game on display, and you genuinely get a sense that they care deeply about each series. I really liked World of Light. And who could forget playing as Master Hand? Too bad you could only do it in story mode. I have played World of Light all the way through three times and have gotten every single spirit in the game. It was a grind and I think I've had my fill of ultimate single player content. Of course there's online too, it's dog shit, it's just so bad, don't play Smash Ultimate online. It's genuinely like a soul crushing experience, and I know everyone's pointed this out already, but the insistence that every match has to be for points is so bizarre. Although, let's be fair, if it weren't for that, I'd have no one to play against because it's so hard to find a goddamn match for no reason. Alongside the release of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, Joker from Persona 5 was revealed as the first DLC pick. I stayed up late watching the Game Awards that night, which I don't recommend at all because that shit is not interesting in the slightest, even after I learned more about the industry. I had known who Joker was at the time, but I only knew basic stuff about him. I was open to seeing him in Smash though. Eventually Joker came out and he was a lot of fun to play as. I will admit that since Persona 5 wasn't on Switch, I watched the Persona 5 anime. Look, I will admit it's not that bad. If I remember the next two characters vividly. E3 was happening in the middle of school, which basically meant an extra juicy Nintendo Direct, but luckily we were given an hour long work period where I watched the Nintendo Direct on my phone. It was a double feature, revealing two new Super Smash Bros Ultimate characters in one trailer, which never actually happened again. Basically, the presentation started with a reveal and ended with another reveal. The first character was Hero from Dragon Quest, which sure, that's a pretty exciting one and a solid pick even if I knew nothing about Dragon Quest. The other one 
Banjo and Kazooie. Holy shit. I was trembling with excitement because they added Banjo Kazooie to Smash. These two characters from a game I never played nor have any nostalgia for are finally home. This is great. As for their playstyles, Hiro was a chaotic mess in Smash, and while he was a lot of fun, it almost felt like laughing at the game rather than with it. It was like a how the hell is this in the game situation. So much of him was deliberately random, and even though it makes him a blast in a casual context, I can't help but feel like there's a better way to do Dragon Quest in a fighting game. Still though, the stage was beautiful, and getting to hear some Dragon Quest music is always welcome to me. Banjo and Kazooie, similarly, had a moveset that just felt a little disappointing to me, since it didn't feel very distinct, and that's absolutely a sentiment I see talked about online. Oh well, they were cool newcomers though. I should be fully truthful though, cause my experience with Smash Bros and the community at large wasn't all good. In the hype cycle, I developed stronger and stronger feelings about what characters should and shouldn't be in Smash, and what Smash means to me. Of course, it's the internet and so I had my fair share of arguments. There were some really awful toxic people on that site, whose entire online presences seemed to be around Venom. And in an environment where newcomers were tied to people's identities, the arguments were vicious. There was a handful of what I could only describe as LOL cows. You know, like, people who would type posts in all caps calling you a stupid weeb and wishing you violence for liking Fire Emblem. And those people who just came to rage about their latest online loss, probably hurling death threats at those who didn't rematch or something. Those people are easily avoidable, and I've only seen a handful of them, but a handful still felt like a lot and something I'd consider an important space to me, where I'd spend hours crafting my own image. There were a lot of people who weren't as bad as them, but felt negative just as frequently, constantly bringing down other people's characters, and annoyingly insisting their characters' fanbases were objectively better. It started to feel like a majority of people in the threads thought of Smash more in terms of what it can give them, instead of what kind of game it could be. I also felt like a lot of people just couldn't have fun like me, and were profoundly desperate about this. I'd come into the Phoenix Wright Newcomer Support thread, thinking I could talk about the Ace Attorney games, and how he could play, but it always just seemed like everybody there just won Phoenix Wright and Smash more than anything else in the world, and there wasn't really a place for those who didn't. It was all or nothing. Now of course, that doesn't mean the set is bad or anything, it's just Smash fans being Smash fans, and they were a minority. I tried to not let some negative people affect my enjoyment of the series, but can you see how negatively this might make me feel? All these newcomers felt like they had so much baggage around them and it felt hard to just casually talk about Smash. It was frustrating to see this space like this, and the cracks started to emerge in my vision of Smash. Not necessarily the game itself, but as the, the entity that is Smash, that monolith that gave me all those things. I started disliking a lot of character ideas, and began to feel so spiteful that perfectly innocent characters felt icky to me. For example, Bandana D from Kirby, perfectly fine idea. A cute Kirby character, but I thought another Kirby character would have been better and Bandana D fan's reaction to this started to make me dislike the character and rosters with him in it. I didn't hate the character at all, it's just I cared about Smash way too much. Same with the concept of another Pokemon characters from the new gen, which is an idea I personally didn't agree with, but in this environment, I began to take it personally. I think about some characters' newcomer ideas, and all I could picture was how disappointed I would be if they were really in Smash. I cared too much. I could only pray that no newcomers would make me feel disappointed. But honestly, right now the hype was swirling so much and the stakes were so high, it felt inevitable. I just hoped it wasn't the next character. Eventually though, the single best challenger pack to ever happen happened. Terry Bogard from Fatal Fury. Look me in the eye. Do you honestly believe I knew who Terry was? No, but his challenger pack was so damn cool. His playstyle was really fun and he quickly became my main. I could do his super moves effortlessly, and to this day I will brag about that. 
there was literally 50 music tracks, some of which were the greatest songs in fighting game history, and there was lots of SNK represented here. You could tell just by Sakurai's little gameplay presentations, the amount they genuinely cared about the company, and it deserves all their respect. I learned about SNK through this. I played Fatal Fury and the King of Fighters, and to this day it's one of my favorite series. All thanks to Super Smash Bros. But at this point we had four characters who didn't come from Nintendo, and I remember there being a debate about if this was how DLC should go, or even how Smash should go. It felt weird for Smash to be so filled with Nintendo characters, when in Ultimate's DLC they were doing a complete 180, and adding all kinds of characters from gaming history instead. I then talked about more online and realized, you know, this roster kind of feels like a relic? I began to see a bunch of different perspectives on this series, and realized it wasn't really as perfect as I thought it was. Still an amazing game, one of the best of the Switch era, but I began to feel unsure. The roster had a lot of quirks that have arisen from everybody returning, like so many Fire Emblem characters and so many Links, and this game's menus and general aesthetic began began to feel soulless to me compared to the past. The game's stage selection felt like it lacked variety, a lot of systems in the game like the menus and music selections were confusing and poorly explained, and I also wasn't a fan of overly literal movesets found in DLC, like Heroes or later Steve's. There was just lots of little criticisms like that I found which added up over time. Those criticisms were critiquing something that was so important to me I barely even thought of it as a game. In an environment where Smash was everything to me, and every minor issue had to be blown out of proportion, what would it mean if this game wasn't as perfect as I thought it would be? To be clear, this isn't some kind of pity party where I lament loss of childhood innocence because somebody criticized my precious Smash. No, I agree with most of those criticisms, still do to this day. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is worth critiquing, that's not the problem here. The problem is that I created for myself a world where every little thing had to matter, where everything you say is endlessly critiqued, and where I have to care so deeply about every element of Smash, I'd get excited when a banana gun item was introduced. So then, what happens when the biggest part of Smash as a whole ends up being disappointing? The next fighters, Byleth and Min Min. Look, when Byleth came out, that shit was funny to me. An 8th Fire Emblem character? I liked Fire Emblem 3 Houses a lot too, so I could laugh at it. Min Min was a character I felt apathetic towards. I liked the idea of an ARMS character at launch, but now that it was DLC and every edition had to be scrutinized so heavily, it didn't appeal to me. Her edition felt boring and corporate, just a shill for a game they had on Switch. I don't know if that was true or not, but considering how common hatred was towards the mere idea of adding more Fire Emblem to Smash, it was hard to imagine a non-cynical explanation for it. Then again, maybe normal people don't think like that. Actually, I'm pretty sure normal people don't think like that. Anyways, Min Min's playstyle is the only moveset in the game I can't derive any enjoyment from whatsoever. In an attempt to be as accurate to its original source, a lot of her moves just involve walking and punching, and an ability to switch between weapons, which I found very dry. I never got any enjoyment playing as her. I can still get enjoyment from characters I'm bad at, Min Min's just miserable. With everything that's happened and all the massive amounts of scrutiny I now look at Smash with, I started to reconsider its place as the king of my thoughts. It's time to put all this into context though. This was 2020, the pandemic. The pandemic was a mixed time for me, cause when it started I was an introvert eager for time off school, but when it ended I was an extrovert who missed my friends dearly and regretted taking them all for granted. Suddenly I was out of school for a long, long time and sure, I watched a ton of TV and played video games I wouldn't before, a pandemic is a great time to catch up on One Piece, but in this state, could I really do something other than focus on Smash all day? I thought, at least that's what I was thinking back then. I always like to live my life thinking about the next enjoyable event in the future. It would keep me going in the morning to always be excited about going to see a friend or do something at school, regardless if it's today or in a week. 
At this time, the only things I could get excited about in the future were all the next Nintendo Directs. If I'm sounding pretty mopey right now, it's the pandemic, it was the general attitude of the time. I still enjoy my time talking about Smash and other video game stuff on the site, and my online friends definitely helped me get through it. I genuinely did really like the extended break. Plus, I couldn't exactly complain about the family I was at home with all day too, but the general atmosphere with Smash speculation and discussions was slower. Characters had such a big gap between them that it didn't really feel like the breakneck hype cycle that was all on everyone's minds anymore. I would have thought online activity would increase with the pandemic, but it was just all more chill, and as the last few newcomers wrapped up, the site didn't feel so toxic anymore. Sure, I felt frustrated by the lack of activity at times, but I generally felt more comfortable and a lot of the positive aspects came to the surface. Plus, most activity wasn't even about Smash anymore. It was like a general video game hub, even a general discussion hub by now. I also felt like more people started to become more and more receptive to Smash criticisms, and levied their own, even if toxic discussions were still happening. Of course though, there were discussions to be had, and 2020 was the year some pretty awful stuff happened in the Smash community. In 2020, over 150 allegations of pedophilia, abuse, and grooming were uncovered from within the competitive Super Smash Bros. community, including from some of the most well-known players at the time. It's awful this happened, but I'm glad it was able to come to light. I don't want to give an impression this situation is about me, because the main takeaway from that situation should be the disgusting systems of power which allowed this behavior to happen, and the horrible culture that arises from. And man, that just made me feel more disillusioned with the community. 2020 was also the year I really became way more critical of Nintendo. They released Super Mario 3D All-Stars, which I was super excited for and loved playing because it was three classic games I hadn't played much that I could re-experience. I ended up playing all three games there for hours. They also deliberately discontinued it after a while, clearly in an attempt to take advantage of FOMO in a really scummy move. It's undeniable how shitty it was, and the collection was just really lazy for a full price release in general. Around now was when they shut down an online Melee tournament due to it not running on official GameCube hardware, when copies of Melee aren't in circulation and cost like $100. And they have no online functionality, cause remember, global pandemic. They later shut down a Splatoon tournament too, cause too many people were saying the slogan free Melee. Nintendo, I realized, has culture made up of a desire for a strange amount of control of things they shouldn't care about, that no normal company would ever think about. I had to stop looking at a billion dollar corporation and Oceans Away's product as something I owed my life to. Look, I like Smash a lot, but it was created like any other product made by any other company. As I stood up and declared this in front of the Super Smash Bros monolith, it just stared back. That didn't change anything about how important this product was in shaping who I am today. It gave me more context, but nothing had changed. I guess it just read as unnerving to me when I realized that. So this is going to be the worst tonal shift I've ever had on this channel, but Minecraft Steve. Oh my god, Steve and Sephiroth. The slower moments were so worth it when those characters came smashing past the border of what a Smash newcomer could be, and they were actually from games I had played this time. I don't think I can describe how big a deal Steve's addition was. He was basically just seen as a goofy meme pick by most of the fanbase, and while Sans and stuff were already in the game, Steve proved that these kinds of characters could be fighters. The idea of newcomers being meme picks was always stupid and a source of arguments for me. I've seen characters like Waluigi or Sans, who have a legitimate case for their memes, be dismissed as meme characters, and that was always silly. I even saw Dante from Devil May Cry call the meme character at one point. What are you fucking talking about? And oh my god, the salt for Steve. I've seen so many people upset that they would dare add an extremely popular character who's been around for 10 years and even pull out the dreaded line, what's next, Jonesy, as if their situations were 
remotely comparable. Again, though, this was at the point where I could laugh it off, and luckily, they were the laughing stock of the community at the time. As for Sefi, I've seen some people criticize Nintendo for not adding more scrimblo bimblo to the level with Scrunklos, and I definitely agree that you could maybe make a case for too many JRPG characters in Smash, but I thought his addition was great anyways, and Final Fantasy deserves more representation. There wasn't really many third-party series with multiple characters who have original movesets too, so he was very welcome indeed. It gave me hope for Eggman. So I played a bit of each character when they came out, but I mostly laid dormant. Sephiroth became my main for a while, but I went back to playing Terry, and then Steve's moveset is kind of a mess. He absolutely destroyed the competitive meta, and I find his moveset to be a bizarrely constructed mess, trying to capture the spirit of Minecraft, whatever that means. Like, the whole crafting system doesn't really feel like it contributes much to his playstyle in my opinion, and it just makes him confusing to use. Not in a hard to master way, in a what the fuck is going on way. Whatever, I know a lot of people do like his moveset, and I admire that they kept his stiff movement from the games and everything. So anyways, time moves on and next direct happens. Oh yeah, I fucking hate Nintendo Directs now. No kid, that's not true. I still get excited to watch each Nintendo Direct, but they always just felt lame to me now. They're really bloated at 40 minutes long, and I just felt like they include way too many unnecessary details about a bunch of games I don't really care about. I'll watch them live, I just need to be doing something else so I don't die of boredom. Well anyways... Pyra and Mithra. Really? My stomach literally sank in disappointment, cause two characters I don't like from a game I never played were in Smash now. I cared way more than I should've. They came out, I bought them, and then I said man, got all their spirits. They didn't really click with me. I didn't have energy to complain anymore. I just felt apathetic about the game and burnt out from years of putting my every stock into it. I wanted to be on the hype train, cause Smash was inescapable, but I'd do it with hesitancy now. And look, all of this is on me, okay? I spent years of my life thinking any criticism against Smash was ridiculous cope, only to suddenly get a way more nuanced view, and now I didn't even know how much I liked the game. So the last two characters were Kazuya from Tekken and Sora from Kingdom Hearts. I liked those. I am a big Tekken fan, currently, although I felt like Kazuya wasn't the biggest surprise since Hihachi was already a me costume. He was a lot of fun though. As for Sora, I had played Kingdom Hearts before, wasn't the biggest fan, although I found it to be a great addition. I'm glad for the Kingdom Hearts fans. I liked how Disney was the final boss of licensing for Smash Ultimate. And with that, Smash is over. I was disillusioned with it at this point, but I was satisfied enough and I'm glad for the final picks. The end of an era. There was an important part I never mentioned about Pyra and Mithra though. My sister really liked them. My friends really liked playing as them. Sure, I might have been burnt out by the silly online or spirit modes and all this hype cycle, but it was still a really fun game. When I'm playing the game with friends, all the online toxicity melts away, and I just have fun with the fun game. Me not thinking Pithra is a perfect newcomer makes no difference. The legacy of Super Smash Bros. Ultimate to me is complicated. It's a game I looked at as imperfect and infallible for so long that I almost blocked out every criticism I could, because that's what everyone was doing. Then, as more and more of its flaws became apparent to me, whenever I brought them up, the discourse felt never-ending, and it soured my experience of the game to the point that I could barely think of it as a game. Not too long ago, the channel Thorgy's Arcade, which I really like, made a video on a potential Smash sequel where he said Peach's moveset should be changed to resemble the Princess Peach Showtime game. I said, ew, that's a terrible idea. That doesn't matter in the slightest. Why do I care about this? I just feel so weirdly irrational about this series, I guess. And that's why I feel slightly apathetic about Smash. But at the same time, it's still the series that shaped who I am today. I still love the games, I still have the nostalgia, and I don't really think my critiques hamper my enjoyment, nor should they. Smash 
occupies such a weird place in my head, and it's because of months of thinking of it as a special thing. Ultimately, I can be a normal person. Look, I can just sit down with my friends and play Super Smash Bros. It's not that big of a deal. And that's why I think I dread the uh, oncoming march of a new Smash Bros. game. The online spaces I rely on are all based on Smash, and if a new game doesn't live up to Ultimate's lofty expectations, could make a lot of people upset, and I'd see strong opinions everywhere daily. I know it's my fault, I really do, but sometimes Smash is inescapable. Smash Bros. is not a constantly miserable place. It's really chill and my time was wonderful at this site. I don't want to leave, but if writing this video has taught me anything, sometimes I should take a fucking break. And going outside more and stuff would be appreciated too, that's never bad. I do go outside, I do stuff that's not video games or YouTube, I promise. I think I engage with the boards and the friends a lot more positively now. But I still can't help but feel conflicted towards Smash Ultimate, in a weird sort of way, because of my own actions. You know, maybe that's okay. I still like this series a lot. This is gonna sound like a really strange conclusion to make, but maybe I shouldn't care that deeply? Yeah, that sounds nice. I don't need to care that deeply about Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. A weird thing happened to me at one point on this very channel. I made a roster idea for if the Super Smash Bros. series started today, and on a whim, I decided to make a video about it, intending for it to serve as a short, quick one to get out while I was making other stuff. In the end, it was 40 minutes long, and it became my most viewed video by far. Still is. My most viewed video before that had 2.2 thousand views. This video got 44 thousand views, and I was astonished by how popular it had become. This isn't to gas myself up, to be clear, I thought the video wasn't my best work. I almost resented that that video was what got so popular. It was like Smash was still there, controlling my life, and little things I said in the video felt like they had bigger consequences when the discord and the comments spun off from them. I even got, not really hate comments, but a lot of comments that were assuming I wouldn't see them. It's such a weird feeling. This channel is my main hobby, and it just felt a little surreal to see me having so much success with Smash on it. I tried a couple videos with the Smash theme afterwards, but they never really had that same amount of popularity. The kind of popularity that's not huge, but makes me look at my YouTube recommended list and realize how many videos that were being shown to me, I had gotten more views then. And look, Success has never been the metric I use to make this channel, but man, this video being successful definitely didn't make me not want to make some more Smash stuff, you know? Like this video, which certainly won't be as long as that one, right? Super Smash Bros. has been with me every step of my life. It was my favorite game as a kid and helped me explore video games as a medium. It showed me what a real community is like and helped me discover myself. I would be fundamentally unrecognizable from who I am today without the effects of the series. I spent years thinking about it as more than a game, as an entity, as a weirdly convoluted metaphor that's a reference to a Stanley Kubrick movie. But like everyone nostalgic for property, there has to be a moment when I grow up and realize I don't owe a billion dollar corporation anything. And for Smash, that moment was harder than it needed to be. I would still find myself thinking about the series in strange, emotion-driven ways. Maybe it's because Ultimate CGI trailers are pushing people to think with their hype, but I can never really tell for sure. Sometimes, when I see people engrossed with my old ways of thinking, I get frustrated a little, but it doesn't really matter. It's a silly kids game. I hope you can remember that, even if it's a silly kids game that's helped me through some of the toughest times of my life. I hope you enjoyed watching. As negative as I might have sounded in places, Smash is a classic and amazing series, and I hope we can share thoughts and memories together. Thank you so much for watching, I'll see you later.
important. I'll see you later. Mic drop. Boom. Ah, sorry, it's just that I made... Oh my god, I made... Look, when I record like a really long video, I get excited. <laughs>